and welcome to Audio Echoes, a books on cassette series produced by Vista Media. These two cassettes feature the wisdom of best-selling author Dr. Ross Campbell as he helps parents understand how to really love their teenagers. And parents aren't the only ones who will benefit from Dr. Campbell's advice. This material is invaluable for anyone who works with and cares for teenagers. Dr. Campbell practices psychiatry in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and is associate professor in the departments of pediatrics and psychiatry at the University of Tennessee College of Medicine. He is also the father of four children. As he interweaves his professional training and personal experience with biblical guidelines, he arrives at many insights and suggestions for adults who are desperately attempting to understand and communicate with their teenagers. As you listen to these cassettes, you may decide you want to spend more time thinking through Dr. Campbell's helpful ideas. If so, we recommend that you get a copy of the book itself. And you may even want to get a leader's guide and begin a group study of this essential material. The reader on these cassettes is Ted Seeley, a devoted professional in the field of Christian communication. He now brings you Dr. Ross Campbell's book, How to Really Love Your Teenager. Chapter 1, The Teenager. Teenagers are children in transition. One of the most common mistakes parents, teachers, and others make regarding adolescents is to consider them junior adults. Many people in authority over teenagers overlook their childlike needs for feeling love and acceptance, for being taken care of, and for knowing that someone really cares for them. Far too many teenagers today feel that no one really cares about them. As a result, many of them have feelings of worthlessness, hopelessness, helplessness, poor self-esteem, and self-depreciation. A teenager may be bigger, smarter, stronger, and in other ways superior to his parents. But emotionally, he is still a child. Unless a teenager feels that priceless assurance of love and acceptance by his parents, he will not be his best or do his best. Very few teenagers are fortunate enough to feel truly loved and accepted as they should be. It is true that most parents have deep feelings of love toward their teenagers. They assume, however, that they naturally and effectively convey this love. And this is indeed the greatest error parents make today. Most parents are simply not transmitting or conveying their own heartfelt love to their teenagers because they don't know how. That is what this book is all about. It is a how-to book to help parents know how to love their teenagers so they will be their best, act their best, and grow to become their best. I pray that it will be not only a book of answers for the weary, confused parent, but also a book of hope. I love teenagers. They're about the dearest people I know. Given what they need emotionally, they are able to respond in such wholesome and joyful ways that sometimes I think my heart will burst. Yes, they are definitely capable of trying us to our utter limits of tolerance and patience. Yes, sometimes we lose our cool and our tempers and feel we simply do not have what it takes to meet their needs. We may even want to run away or give up. But, dear parent, hang in there. Our perseverance is indeed worth it, for it is a priceless wonder to see our teenagers develop into pleasant and productive adults. I truly want this book to be a source of hope to you. The last thing I want is to cause you to feel guilty. We all make mistakes. Just as there are no perfect children, there are no perfect parents. Don't let guilt from past mistakes damage your efforts to raise your teenagers well. Most adolescent problems can be alleviated or rectified by correcting tensions in the parent-teenager relationship. However, there are some teenager problems which are caused or aggravated by neurological ills or physiological depression. These medical problems must be alleviated before attempting to correct parent-teenager relationships. Take, for instance, the story of a girl we'll call Debbie Batten. Her parents sat in my counseling room and told me this story. I can't believe she did it, explained Mrs. Batten. She was such a good girl, all was content, never gave us much trouble. I thought we were giving Debbie everything she needed, clothes, church, good home, and all. She always seemed happy. Why would she ever try to kill herself? How could she have taken all those pills? Did she really want to die, or is she just trying to get attention? I'm so confused, and she's gotten so hateful and sullen. I can't talk to her, and she won't talk to me. 
She just wants to spend time by herself in her room, and her grades have become terrible. When did you notice these changes in Debbie, I asked. About two or three years ago, replied Mrs. Batten. But it was so gradual, we didn't think anything was seriously wrong until fairly recently. She's 15 now. During the last few months of sixth grade, we noticed she became bored, first with school. Her grades began falling. Then Debbie gradually became bored with life. She gave up her favorite activities one by one and seemed to lose interest in everything, including church. She began to avoid her good friends and spend more and more time by herself. She talked less and less. But everything became even worse when she began seventh grade. She completely withdrew from her old standby friends and began running around with kids who were in trouble most of the time. Debbie's attitude worsened as she became more like her new friends, and they often led her into trouble, deep trouble. But we've tried almost everything, Mrs. Batten continued. First we spanked her. Then we began taking away her privileges and freedoms. We've grounded her. We've tried rewarding her for good behavior. We've talked to everyone we thought might be able to help us. I really believe we've tried everything. We love Debbie, Dr. Campbell. What can be done? Is it hopeless? I saw Debbie later after her parents left. She was a pretty girl with likable ways. Although unquestionably intelligent, she had difficulty speaking in a clear, audible way. She communicated mostly with grunts and many uh -huns. Debbie did not have the natural spontaneity and enthusiasm we like to see in an early adolescent. She was obviously unhappy, and it was difficult to communicate with her. However, when Debbie felt more comfortable, she spoke more freely, and her eye contact improved. As the conversation continued, it became clear that Debbie was suffering from an increasingly frequent and serious adolescent problem, depression. For years, Debbie had longed for a close, warm relationship with her parents. But during the past few months, she had gradually given up hope in this dream. More and more, she turned to her peers, who she thought would accept her more lovingly. But her unhappiness deepened even more. Debbie represents a common and tragic occurrence among early adolescent girls. Debbie seemed to be happy and content during her earlier years. Even though she had parents who deeply loved her and cared for her, Debbie did not feel genuinely loved. She did not have the precious and crucial feeling of being completely and unconditionally loved and accepted. Is it the parents' fault? Are they to be blamed? I do not believe they should be. Mr. and Mrs. Batten have always loved Debbie, but have never known how to convey their love. As with most parents, they have a vague notion of the needs of a child, protection, shelter, food, clothes, education, guidance, love, etc., they have met essentially all these needs except unconditional love. I believe parents who really desire to give their teenagers what they need can be taught to do so. Parents need to learn how to genuinely and effectively transmit their love to their teenagers. And that is what this book is all about. Chapter 2, The Home Chuck's parents brought him to me because of truancy, stealing, and disobedience. The Hargraves talked about their son with frustration and anger. The intensity of their negative feelings toward the boy concerned me. Chuck said nothing but sat solemnly with his eyes downcast while he listened to his parents' accusations. When he finally spoke, he did so in a soft, meek voice and with short phrases rather than sentences. I spent some time with Chuck alone after his parents left the office. He was angry, but he couldn't tell me exactly why. It soon became evident that Chuck was confused about himself and about the relationship between his parents. He was also puzzled regarding his misconduct, for he was a bright boy, and his stealing, since he did not need the items that he took, and it was obvious that he had set himself up to be caught. Chuck's case is not unusual. Although his parents mean well, they have made several mistakes in raising Chuck. Their marriage is in trouble, largely because they have not learned to share their feelings and opinions with each other. Mrs. Hargrave has never been able to express her normal anger in an open, healthy, direct way to her husband. Therefore, she manifests her anger by getting back at him in subtle and indirect ways, such as overspending. 
Mr. Hargrave, who feels unable to be openly honest with his wife, expresses his anger by being silent, avoiding eye contact, and evading family and home responsibilities. Chuck has learned his lesson well. Because open, honest discussion and expression of feelings do not exist in the Hargrave home, Chuck demonstrates his anger by doing things which embarrass and upset his parents. Due to lack of normal communication, Chuck has never known his parents' expectations of him. He was a boy who naturally wanted to please. But how could he? He gave up trying to live up to his parents' standards because he never knew what they were. The first responsibility of parents is to provide a loving and happy home. And the most important relationship in the home is the marriage bond, which takes primacy over the parent-child relationship. The security of the teenager and the quality of the parent-child bonding are largely dependent on the quality of the marital bonding. Every teenager needs parents whose marital relationship is one of stability, respect, love, and good communication. The ability to communicate feelings, especially unpleasant feelings, is critical in the marital relationship. Especially during times of stress, this honest, open talking it out is absolutely critical and can determine whether stress will enhance or break a marriage. In my own marriage, I have discovered this importance of communications over and over, and usually the hard way. I believe the most stressful period of our marriage was right after the birth of our second daughter, Kathy, who was born with several physical deformities. I had a difficult enough time handling this, but when she was a year old, it slowly became apparent that Kathy was profoundly mentally retarded along with having cerebral palsy and a severe seizure disorder. As a 24-year-old husband and father, I felt anger, rage, extreme pain, and feelings of guilt and inadequacy. Kathy was a child care nightmare. When she could finally move herself along the floor, she would head straight to the garbage can and try to eat the garbage or anything else she could put in her mouth. She had little sense of pain, and would often attempt to place her hands on the hot stove burners. Kathy had to be watched closely every second because her constant striving was toward doing things that were dangerous to her. All this began in my first year of medical school. With Kathy's expenses and the pressures of medical school, our financial situation was quite bleak. I remember wondering many times how our marriage could possibly survive. Pat has always been the more emotionally mature partner in our marriage. The pain about Kathy and our untenable situation was just as difficult for her as it was for me. But her response was so different from mine. In the midst of constant heartbreak, Pat carefully looked after Kathy's every need with patience, gentleness, and devoted love. She seldom gave in to the agonizing feelings which were driving me away. Her inner beauty of love, gentleness, and patience were beyond my comprehension. I somewhat resented her for this and tended to pull away from her and Kathy whenever I reasonably could. Yet I truly loved Pat and realized that instead of helping her, I was adding to her crushing burden. So I felt guilty and utterly helpless. I went to several people seeking help on how to deal with this agony. But no one knew what I was talking about. I was barely coping. I hurt inside for Kathy from morning to night. I had difficulty concentrating on my studies and kept wondering how we were going to manage financially. In short, I was miserable and feared that we could not survive much longer. I wondered, how much stress can a marital relationship be expected to bear? Will it break or simply die? By this time, Kathy was five years old. Her seizures were becoming worse and were less and less controlled by medication. Eventually, the slightest environmental change would set off another seizure. Kathy would not eat for three days following a seizure. When the frequency increased to several a day, forced tube feeding became necessary. It finally became obvious that Kathy could not survive outside of a hospital. Then came the most difficult, agonizing decision and day of our lives. We had to permanently place Kathy in a hospital for the mentally retarded. Imagine turning our precious five-year-old daughter over to people we didn't even know. I wasn't sure I could handle this at all. But again, I noticed my dear, dear wife, Pat, struggling with just as much pain and agony as I. She knew what we had to do, made the decision, found the courage to accept it, and never lost her inner peace and beauty. 
I learned slowly. But this time, I decided that I had much to learn from my wife. She had taught me, as only a woman can, how to live with life's most unbearable situations. Every type of personality has its advantages and disadvantages. In the situation with Kathy, Pat was the stronger, and I needed to learn from her, and sometimes lean on her. In other situations, I happen to be better able to cope, and then I can help Pat. The point of all this is to understand that stress will come into every marriage. Whether the stress hurts and destroys the marriage or enhances it depends on the response of husband and wife. My initial response to a cruel situation was destructive. But because I learned to cope with inner pain rather than run from it, Pat and I are now able to face together those problems which produce emotional pain. Fellow parents, if we persevere through the problems which put stress on our marriage, we will grow as spouses. If we continue to carry out our marital responsibility as a lifelong commitment, we will grow together in love, appreciation, and respect. We must live and think as though there are no other alternatives than to make this marriage work. Yes, it is work. It is hard work. And it takes this lifelong commitment of both spouses. Another common problem is the role reversal in which a parent demands that a child fulfill the parent's emotional needs. While this can happen in any home, it is more likely to occur in a one-parent family. Some single parents feel tempted to use their teenagers as colleagues or confidants. Because of loneliness, feelings of inadequacy, depression, or other causes, single parents at times find it difficult to avoid relating to their teenagers as contemporaries. These parents may share intimately personal information, which the teenagers are not ready to handle. Such parents tend to be best friends with their teenagers instead of maintaining healthy parent-child relationships. I have seen extreme examples of this. Jim was a 16-year-old boy who frequently got drunk with his father in a bar. Although this happened because of the father's loneliness and lack of friends, the father rationalized to himself that he was making a man of his son. I remember Julie, whose mother would have her boyfriend bring a date for Julie so they could go out together. While these are obviously extreme examples, role reversal is not unusual. Lesser forms of misusing teenagers in this way are very common. For example, parents complain to teenage children about how lonely, depressed, unhappy, or misused they are. This is not parenting. A parent fulfills the emotional needs of a child or a teenager. For the teenager to fill the emotional needs of a parent is reversal of roles and is unwholesome. A teenager treated in this way cannot develop normally. I have never particularly enjoyed being an authority for anyone, especially for my children. I too am tempted to treat my children as contemporary friends, but I dare not. Yes, I am loving and friendly with them and enjoy laughing and having fun. And on occasion, I will share appropriate personal information with them, but only for their educational benefit, not for my emotional benefit. I must not forget that I am their father and that they need my authority and direction. If I relinquish or neglect my responsibility for being the authority in the home, along with Pat, for she too must assume her position of authority, my children will not be happy. They will feel insecure and will be very apt to develop poor behavior patterns. As parents, our first responsibility is to make our children feel genuinely loved. Our second responsibility is to be authority figures for our children and to lovingly discipline them. Chapter 3, Unconditional Love You want to feel good about yourself as a parent. Many people question if this is possible. Let me assure you that it is very possible both to be a good parent and to feel confident that you are. And the basic foundation for a solid relationship with your teenager is unconditional love. Only unconditional love can prevent problems such as resentment, guilt, fear, or the insecurity of feeling unwanted. Without this foundation, it is impossible to really understand your teenager or know how to guide him or deal with his behavior. When you begin with unconditional love, 
you can then build your knowledge and expertise in guiding your teenager and filling his needs on a daily basis. You will also know where you are succeeding as a parent and where you are not. Unconditional love means loving a teenager no matter what. No matter what the teenager looks like. No matter what his assets, liabilities, and handicaps are. No matter how he acts. This does not mean that you always like his behavior. Unconditional love means you love your teenager even when you detest his behavior. Unconditional love is an ideal. You cannot love a teenager or anyone else 100% of the time. But the closer you come to this goal, the more satisfied and confident you will feel and the more pleasant and satisfied your teenager will be. I help myself by constantly keeping in mind that one, teenagers are children. Two, teenagers will tend to act like teenagers. Three, much of teenage behavior is unpleasant. Four, if I do my part as a parent and love them despite their unpleasant behavior, they will be able to mature and give up their immature ways. Five, if I love them only when they please me, they will not feel genuinely loved. This in turn will make them feel insecure, damage their self-image, and actually prevent them from developing more mature behavior. Therefore, their behavior development is as much my responsibility as theirs. 6. If I love them unconditionally, they will feel good about themselves and be comfortable with themselves. They will be able to control their anxiety and, in turn, their behavior as they grow into adulthood. 7. If I love them only when they meet my requirements or expectations, they will feel incompetent. They will believe it is fruitless to do their best because it is never enough. Insecurity, anxiety, and low self-esteem will plague them. 8. For my sake, as a struggling parent, and for the sake of my children, I pray my love for them will be as unconditional as I can make it. The future of my teenagers depends on this foundation. Do you know what is the most important question in your teenager's mind? Without realizing it, he is continually asking, Do you love me? It is absolutely the most important question in the teenager's life. And he asks the question primarily through his behavior rather than with words. The answer you give to that question is absolutely critical. If you answer it no, your teenager will not be or do his best. The problem is that most parents do not know how to answer yes, and they don't know how to convey their love to their teenagers. One of the main reasons most parents do not know how to convey their love to their teenager is because teenagers, like younger children, are behaviorally oriented. Adults are primarily verbally oriented. Having a warm feeling of love in your heart for your teenager is wonderful, but it's not enough. Saying, I love you, to a teenager is great and should be done, but it is not enough. For your teenager to know and feel you love him, you must also love him behaviorally, because he is still primarily behaviorally oriented. Only then can he answer yes to the crucial question in his heart, do you love me? Your teenager sees your love for him by what you say and do. But what you do carries more weight. Your teenager is far more affected by your actions than by your words. It is also important to remember that your teenager has an emotional tank. This tank is figurative, of course, but the concept is very real. Your teenager has certain emotional needs, and whether these emotional needs are met through love, understanding, discipline, etc., helps determine how he feels, whether he is content, angry, depressed, or joyful. Also, it strongly affects his behavior, whether he is obedient, disobedient, whiny, perky, playful, or withdrawn. Naturally, the fuller the tank and the more positive the feelings, the better the behavior. At this point, let me make one of the most important statements in this book. Only if the emotional tank is full can a teenager be expected to be his best and do his best. It is your responsibility as a parent to do all you can to keep the emotional tank full. Children and teenagers may be conceptualized as mirrors. 
they generally reflect rather than initiate love. If love is given to them, they return it. If none is given, they have none to return. Unconditional love is reflected unconditionally, and conditional love is returned conditionally. As we mentioned before, teenagers are children emotionally. To illustrate this, let's look at how a teenager is like a two-year-old. Both a teenager and a two-year-old have drives for independence, and both have emotional tanks. Each will strive for independence, using the energy from the emotional tank. When the emotional tank has run dry, the teenager and the two-year-old will do the same thing, return to the parent for a refill, so they can again strive for independence. A teenager will strive for independence in typical adolescent ways, doing things by himself, going places without family, testing parental rules. But he will eventually run out of emotional gasoline and come back to the parent for emotional maintenance, for a refill. This is what we want as parents of teenagers. We want our adolescent to be able to come to us for emotional maintenance when he needs it. There are several reasons why this refilling is so important. One, teenagers need an ample amount of emotional nurturance if they are to function at their best and grow to be their best. Two, they desperately need full emotional tanks in order to feel the security and self-confidence they must have to cope with peer pressure and other demands of adolescent society. Without this confidence, teenagers tend to experience difficulty in upholding wholesome ethical values. 3. The emotional refilling is crucial because while it is taking place, it is possible to keep open lines of communication between parents and teenagers. When a teenager's tank is empty and he seeks parental love, Communication is so much easier. Most parents do not realize how important it is for their teenager to be able to come to them to have his emotional tank refilled. During times when a teenager is striving for independence, he may upset his parents to such an extent that the parent overreacts emotionally and usually with excessive anger. But if parent-child communication is broken, a teenager may turn to his peers for emotional nurturance. What a dangerous and frequently disastrous situation this is. For a teenager will then be easily susceptible to peer pressure, to influences of religious cults, and to unscrupulous persons who use young people. When a teenager tests you by striving through inappropriate behavior to be independent, you must be careful not to overreact emotionally. This does not mean you condone misbehavior. You need to express your feelings honestly but appropriately. That is, without extreme anger, yelling, name-calling, attacking the child verbally, or otherwise losing control of yourself. The more a parent loses self-control in a teenager's presence, the less respect a teenager will feel for his parent. You should make every effort to maintain emotional control of yourself, regardless of how your teenager expresses his drive for independence. You must keep open the avenues over which your teenager returns to you to have his emotional tank refilled. This is crucial if he is to enter adulthood as a whole person. Chapter 4, Focused Attention In the scriptures, we see a very high regard for children. King David called them the heritage of the Lord. Christ said that no one should prevent the little ones from coming to him and warned that those who offend his little ones would be better dead. He said that unless we become as children before him, we will not enter the kingdom of God. Teenagers ought to be made to feel that they are special. Few teenagers feel this way, but oh, the difference it makes in them when they know they are special. Only focused attention can tell them this. It is vital to the development of their self-esteem and it profoundly affects their ability to relate to and love others. Focused attention means giving your teenager full, undivided attention in such a way that he feels truly loved, that he knows he is so valuable in his own right that he warrants your watchfulness, appreciation, and uncompromising regard. Focused attention makes your teenager feel that he is the most important person in the world to you, his parents. I believe that focused attention is the most demanding need a teenager has. Most parents have real difficulty recognizing this need, 
much less fulfilling it. Other things they do for their teenagers, favors, gifts, and granting unusual requests, seem to substitute for focused attention at the time. These things may be good, but it is a serious mistake to use them to replace genuine focused attention. Without focused attention, a teenager experiences increased anxiety because he feels everything else is more important than he is. He is consequently less secure and becomes impaired in his emotional and psychological growth. Such a teenager can be identified rather easily. He is generally less mature or sure of himself than teens whose parents have taken the time to fill their need for focused attention. This unfortunate teenager is often withdrawn and has difficulty with peers. He is less able to cope and usually reacts poorly in conflict. He is overly dependent on others, including peers, and is more subject to peer pressure. Some young teenagers, however, especially girls deprived of focused attention from their fathers, seem to react in just the opposite way. They are quite talkative, manipulative, dramatic, and often seductive. They are sometimes considered precocious, outgoing, and mature as children. But as they grow older, this behavior pattern does not mature and gradually becomes more inappropriate. By the time they are older teenagers, they are usually obnoxious to their peers as well as to adults. However, even at this late date, focused attention, especially from their fathers, can go a long way in reducing their self-defeating behavior, decreasing their anxiety, and freeing them to resume their maturational growth. I have found that the best way to give a teenager focused attention is to set aside time to spend with him alone. You may already be thinking how difficult that is to do, and you are right. Finding time to be alone with a teenager, free from other distractions, is what I consider to be the most difficult aspect of good child rearing. But let's face it, good child rearing takes time. It takes tremendous effort to pry time from busy schedules. But when you do, the rewards are great. For it's a wonderful thing to see your teenager happy, secure, well-liked by peers and adults, and learning and behaving at his best. But such satisfaction does not come automatically. As parents, you must pay a price for it. You must find time to spend alone with each child. For example, when my daughter was taking music lessons near my office on Monday afternoons, I would schedule my appointments so that I could pick her up. Then we would stop at a restaurant and have supper together. At these times, without the pressure of interruption and time schedules, I was able to give her my full attention and listen to whatever she wanted to talk about. Only in this context of being alone without pressure can parents and their child develop that special, indelible relationship which each child so desperately needs to face the realities of life. A child treasures moments like these and remembers them when life becomes difficult, especially during those tumultuous years of adolescent conflict. As children grow older, these times of focus need to be lengthened. Older children need time to warm up, to let their developing defenses down, and to feel free to share their innermost thoughts, especially those that may be troubling them. As children enter adolescence, they need more time with family, not less. It is so easy to assume that since teens are rapidly becoming more independent and seem to want more and more time away from the family, that you should spend less and less time with them. This is one of the most devastating mistakes parents make today. As their children enter and progress through adolescence, parents often use their free time in ways which meet their own pleasure needs. Every teenager I've known interprets this as rejection feeling that their parents care less and less about them. Adolescents are facing strong influences daily, and unfortunately, many of these influences are unhealthy, unwholesome, and sometimes evil. If you want your teenager to be able to cope with today's world, you must spend constructive time with him, especially when he's going through adolescent turmoils. If you do take the time to meet these needs, your teenager will gain the confidence and personal integrity to think for himself about the kind of values he will live by. I remember when my precious daughter Carrie was 14 years old. What a year! She was undergoing the typical transitions of early adolescence and would frequently communicate only with grunts like uh-huh, uh-uh, and huh. During this period, I made two wonderful discoveries. First, it is useless and harmful 
to try to force a child to open up and talk at such a time. Although it was a real temptation to badger her with questions, I discovered this was a mistake and actually worsened the situation. Second, if I spent at least 20 to 30 minutes with Carrie in a pleasant way, which did not put any pressure on her to communicate, her defenses would slowly come down, and we were then able to really share thoughts and feelings. One of the most effective ways to accomplish that was to take her to a restaurant. I would pick the restaurant with the slowest service in town and would try to arrive during the busiest time so we could wait in a long line. I would ask the waitress to come back a couple of times. We're not quite ready to order. I would eat very slowly and then order a dessert, which I normally avoid, followed by a leisurely cup of coffee. You see, the purpose of all this was to provide a time together when Carrie was under no pressure to communicate and could still be comfortable in my presence. Standing in line in a public place meets this requirement. By the time we finished eating, Carrie would be talking fairly freely and sharing, but with the conversation still at a rather superficial level, sports, teacher, schoolwork. Then I would pay the bill and we would go to the car. Let me interject an interesting piece of information here. When you're driving a car with your teenager as passenger, especially if other teenagers are with you, you somehow lose your own identity and are considered as part of the car, an extension of the steering wheel. My wife and I really appreciate this adolescent ability. It's amazing how this facilitates adolescent conversation while riding along in a car. It is likewise amazing how much we learn during these times. Anyway, back to Carrie and me. We would get in the car, and usually, during the last mile or so before getting home, she would finally talk about things that were very meaningful to her. Things like peer relationships, family relationships, peer pressure to take drugs. Of course, the conversation couldn't be completed before we drove up to the house, typical of teenagers. The reason for this is that teenagers need to feel they have a means of escape when revealing meaningful information. They must feel that they are in a position to leave if the parents are not responding properly to their innermost feelings. What they fear most is not disagreement, but anger, ridicule, disapproval, or rejection of them on a personal level. They must feel enough in control so that if they become too uncomfortable, they can remove themselves. This is why Carrie would wait until we were near home before she would share with me what was really important to her. So the best conversations I had with Carrie were at these times. Sometimes she would disguise her own conflicts by talking about or asking about another teenager who happened to have similar problems. This is a favorite way many teenagers use to talk about awkward, embarrassing, difficult to handle situations. Sometimes a teenager needs to talk to a parent about a problem but has a difficult time initiating the conversation. At such times, he will frequently throw out hints. These hints can take various forms. A teenager who needs to talk, but who's in a non-communicative mood, may say something much less threatening than what he actually wants to talk about. For example, he may start out by asking a question about homework, perhaps a question about the day which the parent has had, or maybe a comment about the day he has had. Parents must be alert for such unsolicited and sometimes puzzling gestures. They are usually a hesitant teenager's way of asking for time and for focused attention. He is feeling us out, testing us, to see what kind of mood and frame of mind we are in, to see if it is safe to approach us on an issue about which he feels uncomfortable. At other times, a teenager may test our receptivity to see if we are in a good mood by putting out what I call a red herring or a smoke screen. These are pieces of information designed to upset or irritate us, a perfect device to see if we can be trusted with what is really on his mind. If we overreact, especially with anger and criticism, the teenager assumes we will react to his important question the same way. Again, the more self-control and calmness we display, the more open and sharing our teenager will be with us. These moments of opportunity are priceless. If we do not notice them and somehow close the door to the teenager, he will feel rejected. If we are alert and can detect these subtle clues, we can respond appropriately and help our teenager, as well as demonstrate conclusively that we love him and are sensitive to his needs. 
I remember many such occasions when Carrie was in her early teens. Most often, she would select a time when she knew her mother and I were alone, with the least likelihood of interruption. You can guess when this was, just as Pat and I were ready to turn off the light for a good night's sleep. Carrie's younger brothers were fast asleep, so she had no competition. First, we would see the door slowly open as Carrie came in and ask her mother if she could borrow something from the adjoining bathroom. After Carrie got the item she asked for and was in the process of leaving, she would turn around and say to us, Oh, by the way, I cannot overemphasize the importance of recognizing and noting these all-too-familiar words, Oh, by the way, or their equivalent. Do you know what they usually really mean when said by a teenager in such a situation? A translation is sometimes like this. The real reason I'm here and what I really want to talk about is coming up. But first I must know, are you in a good frame of mind to handle it? Can I trust you with this very delicate personal part of my life? Will you take it and help me? Or will you use it against me? Can I trust you? If we do not give that focused attention at such a time, a teen will interpret the answer to be no. But if we focus our attention directly on the child, and listen intently and quietly, letting him control the conversation, our teenager will feel it is safe to take a chance and reveal a pressing problem. Incidentally, be ready for those famous four words after a red herring or smoke screen. I remember that I would sometimes goof and do something like telling Carrie to be sure to turn out all the lights, and then would feel a swift kick under the covers, because my wife would recognize what the child was telling us and would know that she needed that precious commodity, focused attention. Always when we were on course, Carrie continued the conversation on her own, talking initially about superficial things and gradually about items which were more and more important to her. After a while, she would be sitting at the foot of our bed. Pretty soon, she would be lying across the foot of the bed, the talk continuing to pour out. Before we knew it, she would be lying between us. Finally, she would get to the thing that was bothering her. I remember one such time when she said, I don't know if Jim likes me anymore. He's been so different. How difficult that was for Carrie to come out with. She had to make sure the situation was safe for her to share. She had to put out her red herrings and smoke screens before she could finally reveal her problem. Once a sensitive issue is out, it is a real temptation for parents to make light of it with a casual, seemingly flippant reply as though it is such a trivial or easy-to-handle issue. We must take our teenagers seriously, examine their problems carefully with them, and help them to come to logical and sensible solutions. In this way, we not only will help them with their problems, but more importantly, will cement our love relationship with them. And as we help them to solve their own problems, we can also be teaching them to think logically, rationally, and sequentially. Only by learning to think clearly can a teenager develop the ability to discern right from wrong and to develop a strong value system. To understand the background of most teenage problems, it's important to be aware of adolescent society. Teenage society is complex, but is based primarily on popularity and acceptance. It is important to know approximately where your child is in this network of relationships because some of the most painful adolescent problems are peer-related and involve one or more of four feelings, envy, guilt, anger, and depression. Anger and depression will be discussed in detail later. So now let's consider envy and guilt. In dealing with peers, teenagers frequently have problems which naturally make them feel guilt or envy. If a teenager's problem involves a peer who is lower on the adolescent society ladder, he will probably feel guilt. If his encounter was with someone above him, the feeling will usually be envy. It's important for parents to see their teenager's position in the conflict and identify the feelings the teenager is struggling with. Explaining the situation to a teenager will help him in several ways. It will enable him to understand exactly what is happening and why. It will help the teenager determine whether he has done anything wrong. It will assist him in handling this situation and others like it. For example, if a teenager is feeling guilty, 
A clear understanding of the situation will usually reveal there is no blame to be laid and that the real problem is actually the other teenager's feeling of envy. If your teenager is feeling envious, it is so helpful for him to be able to identify this within himself and to understand why. Then you'll be in a position to help him correct the problem by understanding that there is no real basis for the jealousy, if this is true, or by learning how to overcome the envy if there is a basis for it. It is vital to the emotional development of our teenagers that we help them to identify and understand envy and guilt in themselves and learn how to handle these emotions properly. If they are unable to, they are likely to be manipulated by guilt. The more sensitive a teenager is, the more susceptible he is to such manipulation. On the other hand, the less sensitive a teenager is, the more apt he is to use this type of manipulation on others. Of course, the classic example of this, and one of the most destructive, is the boy who attempts to induce a girl to have a sexual encounter with him with such remarks as, if you really loved me, you would. The parent of a sensitive teenager is in an excellent position to teach the child about this unwholesome device. The teenager needs to understand three things. How to recognize manipulation by guilt, that this device is unwholesome, unhealthy, and unethical, that it is wrong, that the normal and justifiable reaction to manipulation is anger. In the story about the confrontation between Jesus and the money changers in the temple, I see manipulation as one element that caused Jesus' anger. The people coming to the temple needed to sacrifice to fulfill their religious obligation. They would feel guilty if they did not offer an animal sacrifice. In the scene which Jesus described as a cave full of robbers, there was manipulation by guilt, and Jesus' anger was an appropriate reaction. Parents must be careful not to manipulate their teenagers by guilt. It is so easy for parents to fall into this trap, especially if they happen to have an extremely sensitive child. A teenager who has been manipulated with guilt by his own parents will be easily manipulated by others. What is the best way to prevent teenagers from being manipulated by guilt? Within the context of unconditional love and focused attention, parents can train their teenagers to identify manipulative behavior in others and to stay free of its trap. Chapter 5 Eye Contact and Physical Contact We live at a time in history when it's critical for our teenagers to feel and know that we really love them. There are unprecedented numbers of outside influences upon them, many of them unwholesome, and some of them evil and destructive. The hour is late. As a parent, you have limited time and opportunities to make your teenager feel unconditionally loved. You must act today and be consistent every day in keeping his emotional tank full. This will enable him to grow into a person who can think competently and clearly for himself and develop good self-control. Only when he truly feels that you unconditionally love and care for him will you have the influence on him that you should. Most parents, although they deeply love their children, are not loving them behaviorally. Consequently, most of our young people today do not feel unconditionally and genuinely loved. This lack of feeling genuinely loved is at the bottom of most youth problems today. A child or teenager tends to follow the person whom he feels loves him the most. Eye contact and physical contact should be incorporated into all of your everyday dealings with your children. They should be natural, comfortable, and not overdone. Appropriate and frequent eye contact and physical contact are two of the most precious gifts you can give your teenager. They, along with focused attention, are the most effective ways to fill your teenager's emotional tank and enable him to be his best. In some homes, there is amazingly little eye contact between parents and teenagers. What exists is usually negative, as when the teenager is being reprimanded or given specific instructions. The more you are able to make eye contact with your teenager as a means of expressing love, the more your teenager will be emotionally nourished with love. Your teenager will vary in his ability to make eye contact. One moment he will eagerly seek it. The next moment he may actually avoid your gaze. 
Within this unevenness, he is learning patterns of eye contact, primarily from what he observes in his home from other members of the family. Some time ago, I saw 17-year-old Bruce. Tall, well-built, and good-looking, he was an excellent student and athlete and had a pleasant personality. Strangely enough, with all these things going for him, he had poor self-esteem and considered himself quite inadequate. It was easy to detect his low opinion of himself simply by observing his pattern of eye contact. His gaze was almost always downward. When he did make eye contact, it was for a fraction of a second. I explained to Bruce that the way he used eye contact strongly affected the way he related to other people. People felt uncomfortable with Bruce. They thought he didn't like them or was ignoring them. They were actually relieved to end a conversation and get away from him. Bruce naturally misinterpreted this as rejection and felt worse than ever. With a steady diet of this pattern over many years, it was no wonder Bruce developed a horrible misrepresentation of himself. Fortunately, it was simple to help Bruce correct his pattern of eye contact. If your teenager has developed abnormal patterns of eye contact, you can teach him how he is misapplying it and how to correct it. Good eye contact can make the difference between success and failure in almost all of life's situations. Giving loving eye contact to your teenager can be difficult, especially during those unpleasant times when he is non-communicative. At times, a teenager can be very difficult to talk with, especially when he merely answers your questions with uh-huh, uh-uh, and similar grunts. These periods of sullenness, withdrawal, and quietness are also usually accompanied by resistance to love and affection from parents. During these times, it is a mistake to force yourself on your teenager or prod him with questions. Often a parent will become irritated, worried, and even desperate and try to open up conversation with persistent questions such as, How did your day go? What happened to you today? Did you have a good time? Who was there? This is irritating to anyone who is not in the mood to talk. The secret is to be available. This means that instead of forcing interaction with your adolescent, you will be available at all times so that he can communicate with you when he is comfortable in doing so. Do not let your teenager's occasional tendency to avoid eye contact irritate you. Try simply to accept it, realizing if you remain available, he will come to you when his emotional tank is dry. At this time, he will be receptive of eye contact and will be communicative. It's important for his self-concept and psychological development for him to know that you will be available when he needs you. Appropriate and consistent physical contact is another vital way to give your teenager that feeling and conviction that you truly care about him. This is especially true when your teenager is non-communicative, sullen, moody, or resistant. During these times, eye contact may be difficult or even impossible, but physical contact can almost always be used effectively. Seldom does an adolescent respond negatively to a light, brief touch on the shoulder, back, or arm. For example, suppose your teenager is just sitting in a chair watching TV. What a simple thing to briefly touch him on the shoulder as you walk by. Usually he will not even notice it, but it registers in his mind. You can use this vital information to give constant, consistent love by frequent, brief doses of physical contact. You can also use it by occasionally giving longer, more intense nurturance with more prolonged doses of physical contact. Even when your teenager is in a non-communicative mood, physical contact can be a means of conveying love to him. As long as your teenager's focus of attention is directed elsewhere, you are able to give prolonged physical contact regardless of the teenager's mood of receptiveness. For example, Suppose your teenager is in an especially difficult state of mind that concerns you. You find an opportunity to talk with him about something which enables you to direct his attention from himself to an object of interest, like pictures or photographs. You can really take advantage of such situations by putting your hand on his arm, shoulder, or back. You should know your teenager well enough to know how much physical contact he can accept at a particular time. In certain situations, it's good to hug and kiss your teenager. Although you do not want to do it so often as to make him uncomfortable, there are times when it is appropriate, when departing or returning from a trip, 
or when the teenager does something of which he is especially proud, like winning an award, or when your teenager comes to you feeling deeply hurt, remorseful, or otherwise troubled and seems to need it. And, of course, there are times when, for no discernible reason, your teenager feels a need for affection. If you are alert to provide it, what a special moment you will have with your child. But you must remain alert for such opportunities because it is sometimes difficult to know when a teenager wants or needs affection. At family conferences, one of the most common questions parents ask me is this. If I have given my teenager very little eye contact and physical contact, how can I make up for it? This is a very good question. Such parents should not overwhelm their teenagers by suddenly giving large amounts of eye and physical contact. First, they need to obtain a baseline, a general idea of how much eye and physical contact their teenagers can accept. Starting from there, they will gradually increase contact over the next weeks and months. The less noticeable the increases are, the better, and the more comfortable the teenagers will be. Someone has said, thank goodness adolescence is a time-limited disease. We parents need to hang in there during this period of difficult and intense change. The more we maintain our cool and self-control, the smoother and less traumatic the time will be. Our children will emerge from the teenage years more mature, and our relationships with them will be better when they reach adulthood. When we remain available to give our teenagers the love they need whenever they can accept it, we are demonstrating the manner in which God relates to us. Paul's assurance to Timothy was that if we are unfaithful to him, he himself will remain faithful. God is constantly available to nurture and help us as members of his family, even when we are rejecting of him.